And thank you very much for uh, having me here and for the kind introduction. So yes, as mentioned today, I'll be talking about uh, how to get started with uh, your quantum computing journey using Python and Qsharp together. Uh, I'm Chris Grenade. My pronouns are they, them. Um, but to kind of open things up, I want to do things a little bit differently and talk about what you probably won't get out of this talk today. Because as it turns out, like many, you know, different domains and technical areas, an hour really isn't enough to learn quantum computing. But that's okay, because what you can learn in an hour is how to take the software development skills you already know and use them with uh, software tools to help you get going. What some of the right and, well, not right, some of the really useful learning resources out there are for you to take the next steps. Uh, what some of the things to go search on your favorite search engine for might be. Um, and last but not least, what some of the communities that you can join uh, to share about your quantum journey and how other people it, and connect others uh, asking similar questions. But, you know, those communities are always really important. So the kind of takeaway that I, I really want to encourage is it, it takes a bit of practice and you'll learn some neat stuff in the next hour, I hope. But, you know, it, it takes some practice. So let's jump in and see what some first steps can really be. Um, so with that kind of in place, a little bit about me. I did my PhD in quantum computing uh, and went on to do a postdoc at the University of Sydney. Uh, both of those I really focused on learning about quantum devices from the classical data we measure out of them. I'm currently at Microsoft Quantum, where I work on the quantum development kit team on things like uh, the Q Sharp libraries, uh, integration with Python and things like that. Um, and as you just heard, uh, together with uh, my co-author and partner, uh, Sarah Kaiser, uh, wrote a book on how you can learn about quantum computing using Python and Q Sharp together. And when, you know, then, uh, uh, not working on the book or uh, Q Sharp libraries, can often be found with Sarah about, uh, on the waters of Puget Sound aboard uh, the Sea Knot. Yeah, we named it that. <laughs> um, so to jump right in then, I always find it helpful when talking about quantum topics to really start from looking at classical topics and kind of re-examining things a little bit. So to that extent, I'll talk a for a moment about classical bits. And here, when we say the word classical in context of quantum computing, what that really means is not quantum. Uh, so a classical bit is a, a unit of information, right? It's the most basic thing we have to work with when we're programming a computer. And it can be in one of two different states. So what we mean when we say a bit is any physical system that can be in one of those two distinct states, like say zero or one. And if I want to go write down a bit using a padlock, okay, maybe it's locked or unlocked. If I want store a bit by what kind of wine I store in a class. Um, you know, and it, it is really easy to think of a bit as being that state because it's so easy to copy and manipulate classical bits that when I think about zero, my brain is acting as a bit in the state zero. Uh, and so, you know, so that's another kind of classical bit. Um, when we start talking about quantum, uh, in quantum computing, we have a very similar idea of the basic unit of information, but now it's a qubit for quantum bit. Um, and so Python libraries like uh, the Q-tip library that we'll be using heavily throughout this talk can help us understand what qubits are, what sorts of states they can have, and how those states uh, are modified and evolved by quantum programs. So in particular, unlike where a classical bit where we had zero and one as a state, the states of individual qubits are represented by vectors. And if you're used to linear algebra from something like machine learning or computer graphics or writing down physics models or things like that, it's the exact same concept uh, that here in quantum computing, we think of the different states a qubit can have as being vectors. So here I can ask Qtip to show me the a vector corresponding to a zero state and a vector corresponding to a one state. And we see they're both two dimensional vectors that we get out. Uh, we can also write down if we're working on a whiteboard or with math or uh, what have you, 
we can write down as a ket. And that's a, a pun that's persisted for a long time in quantum computing. Um, it's called a ket because it's half of a bra ket. We'll see in a moment that if I flip around and put the angle bracket the other way, it's called a bra. So if you put a bra and a ket together, you get a bra ket. Anyway, uh, so as an example, I might take as a qubit a photon, right? And if you've ever, you know, worn like polarized sunglasses and tilted your head to the side and looked at your screen and it all goes dark, right? What you're seeing there is that that's, that's a bunch of qubits. They're in different polarizations. Either, you know, I might think of my zero state as being the vector describing a vertical polarization or my one state as being the vector describing horizontal polarization. And when I flip it, turn my head over 90 degrees, I'm effectively rotating one of those vectors into the other to do a not gate. Um, and as it, it turns out, what's really unique and powerful about uh, qubits is that I can also make new states from linear combinations. So if I wanted to make, uh, you know, hold my head at 45 degrees instead of going all the way from zero to one state, Right, that's not a state that's labeled by a classical bit anymore, but rather it's a linear combination of zero and one. Um, and so we'll get something on the diagonal. Uh, so if you've ever heard the term superposition, that, that's really all that means, right? It means linear combination like this, where we can add vectors together to get a new quantum state. Um, so effectively, when we write down vectors, kind of the big takeaway for me and you know what we talk a fair bit about in our book is that the different states a qubit can be in act as directions, right? That I can think of that uh, vertical polarization or that horizontal polarization uh, as being different directions. Uh, and I'm not sure why it's not showing up, sorry. There's supposed to be a picture of a sphere here, but just decided to not. Uh, so my apologies. Uh, there's supposed to be having a bit of a technical difficulty with the slide there, but there's supposed to be a picture of um, a block sphere on this. So that's uh, this idea that we use a lot to describe individual qubits in quantum computing where you can kind of think of zero as being the North Pole on a globe and one as being the South Pole on a globe. Um, and so that gives us another way of thinking spatially about what it means for states to be directions. Um, so when we talk about those states like ze the zero state and the one state that are described by classical bits, like the zero and one classical states, we call those the computational basis. Those are the quantum states that correspond exactly to what we're used to from classical computing. Um, but we can also add those states together to get new states, such as the diagonal polarization state that I mentioned a moment ago. All right. But, he, you know, I've been talking a lot about qubits so far, but I kind of swept something under the rug. I'm not quantum, I'm classical. So if I'm talking about information and I have information that I care about as a developer, as a user, or just going about my day-to-day -day life, it bloody well better be classical. So how do we get back to classical bits? So to take a qubit and go back to classical bits, we use measurement, right? So we look at a qubit and we can measure it to get out a classical bit that we can then go continue working with, with all the uh, classical computing techniques that we're used to. So in particular, we talk about if we prepare a state described by some vector, uh, we can write it down as a cat psi, we'll get a measurement outcome we can use, uh, a, a measurement outcome. And here we can use a bra, so that's the conjugate transpose of the cat vector. Um, and if we take the inner product of those two and square it, we get the measurement probability for seeing that outcome. And this is kind of the fundamental rule that ties quantum mechanics together. It says, if I prepare a given state and I perform a given measurement, what's the probability we'll see that measurement outcome? Um, so looking at a couple examples, I really should, if I prepare a classical, it, it, like uh, prepare a quantum state that's effectively a classical label, so something in the computational basis. 
and I go measure back in the computational basis, I really should get that same bit back. So for instance, if I see a zero state, or sorry, if I prepare a zero state and I look to see if it's in zero, I should get that back with 100% probability. So we can check that using Q-tip. And indeed we see if I take the inner product of that zero ket with another zero ket, uh, and I square it using just the Python square opera, uh, power operator, I get back one. So that's probability of one that I, uh, that I actually see that probability, or, sorry, see that measurement outcome. Similarly, if I prepare one and I measure one, I should get back to one with 100% probability, and that's what we see. If I prepare and measure in different computational basis states, then I should never see that outcome. And indeed, that's what happens. But what about superposition? So, you know, we have the, if I'm thinking of a sphere and zeros here at the top and ones here at the bottom, I could prepare something anywhere else on that sphere. So one state we'll talk about a lot is the plus state. Um, and so this is a superposition that is a linear combination. It's just the zero state plus the one state. And here we need to divide by square root of two just to make sure all of our probabilities add up to one. Um, so when I go and use Qtip and NumP together to make that state, and I prepare in zero, measure in plus, I'll get um, that I see that outcome with 50% probability. So here, you know, if you ever hear people talk about quantum mechanics being random and stuff like that, this is kind of what they're meaning, right? That this is where I've prepared and measured in different bases. And so I don't always get the same answer out. And in fact, if I'm preparing zero and measuring plus, I'll get the output, get that output with 50% probability. It's same as if I prepared in one and measured in plus. But as it turns out, quantum isn't just random. There's actually things that are really predictable about it. So if I prepare in plus and I go measure in that same basis, then I'll get the that answer back with 100% probability, right? And if I think again of that sort of picture of a block sphere, um, plus overlaps with itself. So when I take the inner product of that plus state with that plus state, I'll get uh, back 100% probability. Um, right, uh, same picture isn't showing up. My apologies again for that. Um, but you know that that's what we saw earlier and checked with uh, Qtip. So let's go see how we can actually use this to do something really cool. So you know I mentioned you can that you get random answers out when you measure, uh, prepare and measure in different bases. You can use that to generate random numbers, um, and that can be you know really important if you don't trust, for instance, the security of your particular random number generator that's you know based on um, basically shuffling up cl information classically that maybe, you know, think that there's, it, want to go use random numbers that are guaranteed by physics. So here I can go simulate that. Okay, simulating it, I don't get any better than what I have on my classical computer, but it gives us a way to learn about how that application will work in practice. Um, so to do that, I import the Qsharp package for Python, and that lets me write Qsharp operations and run them on simulators and things like that from within my Python notebook. And so doing this, I'll write an, a Q-sharp operation. So that's our most basic kind of subroutine that says, here's something that can work with quant uh, qubits. Here I can ask the device that that operation is running on for a qubit, and I can send different instructions to it. Um, and we'll see a little bit about those in a moment. But those instructions will prepare the plus state and then measure back in zero or one. And so doing that, we see that 50-50 probability we talked about earlier that if I run this a bunch on a simulator here running locally on my machine, I'll see about 50-50 measurement outcomes as a result of that. So what's going on here? This works because that H call that we see here is an instruction that when it acts on the qubit in the zero state, prepares it in the plus state. And I can use uh, diagnostics built into that Qsharp Python package and into the quantum development kit 
to go see how that instruction works. So here, for instance, I can ask the simulator, what state is it using to go see it simulate and predict what those qubits will do? Now, when I run it, I get out this table that tells me uh, the coefficient or amplitude in front of the zero state is one over square root of two. The amplitude in front of the one state is one over square root of two. Um, and that corresponds to that plus state we saw earlier. So that can give us a way of understanding what that H instruction does. Um, and it, it does this because quantum operations like H, these basic instructions that I have access to, can be simulated by matrices, much like we can simulate rotations of our camera in a game, or like I can simulate you know, transformations of a map in uh, GIS by matrices. Here, I can really think of that transformation that took me from that vertical polarization, if I'm thinking about photons, if I'm thinking about phase and the superconducting qubit, I'll have a different kind of rotation, but they can both be described by a transformation that takes that zero direction and turns it diagonally into that plus, uh, uh, plus direction. Um, and so that matrix here, uh, we can just write it down. And that's what lets us simulate what the H instruction does to the state of our qubit. Um, and what's really neat about this particular rotation is that if I take that matrix H and I square it, I get the identity matrix back. So that tells us that we should actually be able to um, apply H twice and have it do nothing. And that's really something um, unique and wonderful about quantum computing, right? That if I just think of it as a fancy way of generating random numbers, that's already neat enough. But the fact that I can undo what seems to have been that kind of random uh, randomization and get back to something deterministic, there's a lot of power in that that we'll see here in a moment. So let's check before we get too far ahead of ourselves that applying H actually does nothing. Sorry, applying H twice actually does nothing. So here that same dump machine instruction tells us that when we asked for a qubit, uh, here with the use statement, did H, uh, it called H twice, we got back to the zero state entirely. Right. Um, and so that confirms the intuition that we developed by looking at those matrices and using Q-tip to do that math. Um, there, there's a lot more instructions than just H. Uh, you can see a complete list uh, in our book or on the quantum development kit documentation. But for instance, if I want to think about a not gate um, in classical computing, the analog in quantum computing for that is the X instruction. And so that will flip my zero to a one, it'll flip my one to a zero, but it'll leave plus alone. It won't do anything to a plus a qubit in the plus state. Um, whereas Z is exactly the opposite. So we can think of this as flipping a phase instead of flipping a bit. It won't do anything to my zero state, um, but it will do something to my plus state. It'll turn it into another state where instead of adding um, zero and one with a plus sign between, I add zero and one with a minus sign between. And that gets us to some ideas out of quantum computing that are really powerful around phase. So kind of the you know, sort of key sorts of takeaways, things you can take with you on the next steps, are that if we prepare and measure on the same basis, we've really kind of just done something with classical bits. If we prepare and measure in different bases, however, we'll get random outputs. And we can simulate how we get those random outputs or how we can recombine them to get back to something deterministic by writing down matrices for each of the quantum instructions we have to work with. Uh, and then we can go simulate those using, uh, using Q-sharp and the quantum development kit from within Python using the Q-sharp package. Um, and this all works because really, when you get right down to it, a quant quantum computing doesn't replace classical computing, right? In the same way I don't, do literally everything on my graphics card, we know there are tasks for which classical computers will always just be better at. So we take and really think of quantum computing as a sort of accelerator, where we take problems that are really useful to run on a quantum computer, and we deploy them to our quantum device and use languages like Q-sharp alongside 
our existing classical languages like Python to help us do computational tasks together. So from that sense, it's a little bit like CUDA or OpenCL or something that lets us program on a graphics card and offload the tasks that are really nice to run on a graphics card while using Python to do all of the uh, pre and post processing and everything like that that we're uh, that Python's really amazing at. Um, so in particular, that's what's happening here when I write an operation in Q Sharp from within my Python notebook. I'm asking that Q Sharp Python package to go compile a quantum program for us. And then we can go and run it on a simulator or things like that, pass Python data over to that operation, get data back from it. I can also, though, in that same quantum program, ask for more than one qubit, right? So, so far, everything we've done has been on one qubit, so we can simulate it with a two by one vector and two by two matrices acting on that vector. What happens if we ask for multiple qubits? Well, we can go look. I can go and use that same dump machine to ask the simulator that's provided with Q Sharp how it will write down the internal state that it uses to simulate multiple qubits. So let's ha look what happens when I ask for two. Now, instead of two possibilities, I have four possibilities, and it has to write down an amplitude so that it is a coefficient for each one of those. If I ask for three, now I have eight different possibility, eight possible classical labels, right? So for three classical bits, I have eight different uh, states they could be in, and each one of those states is a different entry in my vector when I write down the state of a three qubit register. Um, and so that means that these outputs are going to get pretty big pretty quickly. If I write, try to write down the state of a 10 qubit register, I'll need a thousand different uh, classical states to do so, and a matrix a vector element for each one of those, and that takes about 16 kilobytes of memory. If I ask for 20 qubits, now I'm getting to 16 megabytes. And on my desktop, I can push maybe around 30 qubits. If you have a really nice um, setup in the cloud, you can get around 40. Um, so this tells us we really can't simulate quantum systems as they get too, too large. And sometimes you'll hear this is why quantum computing is so powerful, but it, it really isn't. This is what makes it difficult to just simulate everything classically. But we need to do a little bit more work to show why it's powerful. And for that, it helps to use what we've seen now about um, how to represent quantum states to actually get the answer out that we want in a useful way. Um, and so for that, we'll need one more technique before we go and see the kind of application that ties everything together. Um, and that is that some instructions we have access to really only make sense when we have more than one qubit. Um, and the most quintessential amongst these is the controlled knot or C knot. Uh, and so that flips the second bit when the first bit is one. So if I make a table, right, the same kind of thing I might use to make, write down a matrix, um, if I'm in the zero state and I apply a C not as sorry, zero, zero state and I apply the C not, I get back to the zero, zero state. But if that first qubit is one, then it'll flip the second qubit, uh, state of the second qubit. So we can use that actually together with the H instruction we've already seen to prepare, uh, something called entanglement. So here, what I'll do is I'll prepare the first of two qubits in the plus state. So that is, it's an equal superposition, an equal linear combination of zero and one. And then when I apply a C naught, now for one of those two parts of that superposition, for one of the two parts of that uh, linear combination, I'm leaving the second qubit alone. In the other, I'm flipping it. And so what I get is that no when, now when I measure at the end, no matter how many times I measure, I'll get the same answer on both of my two qubits. I won't know what answer that is a priori, but it tells me that there's these two are really strongly correlated by using that entanglement. And so what this really shows us is that you, know, you hear a lot of things said that are kind of in 
that make entanglement sound really scary, but it isn't. It's just another way of seeing superposition, but here with multiple qubits. But we can actually use that to do some really bloody neat stuff. So to kind of tie it all together, let's look at it in, in an example. And here, you know, we'll I'll pull the example that Sarah and I use in our book. Uh, suppose that the lady of the left, Namu herself, wants to test if Merlin is really as wise as he claims, because she needs to entrust the sword to somebody after all. But she really just doesn't want to involve herself too deeply in the affairs of mere mortals. And so what she wants to do is, while learning as little as possible, answer one question. Is Merlin consistent in his judgment? And so I can make a table of different things that uh, Merlin might choose. He might pick Arthur to be the next king. He might pick Mordred to be the next king. But we really want to make sure that no matter what he picks, he isn't doing something like picking both of them or picking neither, right? So Namu wants to test, create a test, that if she asks Merlin one question, that she learns only whether or not Merlin will pick exactly one uh, candidate to be the next king. Thankfully, this can be solved quantumly, right? So classically, it seems kind of ridiculous. Uh, if I want to know whether the answers to should Arthur be the king or should Mordred be the king are the same, I had to ask two questions. I had to learn two classical bits of information out of that problem. But kind of the key intuition here is that Arthur and Mordred are different questions that Nemu can ask Merlin. So why not ask a linear combination of those two questions to get something out that really is a correlation between the two answers. Um, and so when we do that, we can write down a Q-sharp operation that represents exactly that. So here, Nemu, with her two qubits, will prepare a particular input state that represents that Arthur plus Mordred question. And then she can ask, ask Merlin, to go do something to those two qubits representing his answer to that question. Um, and so we can represent that by taking an input that's what Merlin should do. Uh, just like in Python, functions and operations in Q-sharp are first class values, so I can pass them around. Um, and this represents that test, because now at the end, uh, Namu can go and do a measurement and actually get one classical bit of information out because she's doing one measurement. And that should hopefully tell her the one classical bit of information she wants to know. So let's test that. So to represent answering, I choose Arthur, uh, Merlin does nothing to, his, uh, to the qubits that he's given by Nami. They're really Nami's qubits, he's just borrowing them. Right? And so when we use that operation we just wrote, Nemu learns that he was consistent in his judgment, picked exactly one output, uh, one question to answer yes to. But just the same way, I could represent Merlin's answer to I choose Mordred as being yes and I choose Mordred to be no by a single X operation, so a bit flip because that'll shuffle those two answers up, but it'll still leave that he answers yes to exactly one of them. And now if I run that same operation again, Nemu learns only that he picked exactly one, but has no idea which one, just the way she likes it. On the other hand, if, I, if Merlin tries to cheat by not making up his mind or by saying none of these, then he'll fail the test. And Nemu will learn, I don't know who you tried to pick, but you did something wrong. I'm not going to trust you. So what I kind of uh, encourage taking away from this is that when we go and simulate um, with multiple qubits, that takes an exponentially larger amount of classical memory, so it can be difficult to do. But that same uh, but working with those multiple qubits also allows us to write down some really interesting questions and ways that we can go and solve those uh, using 
quantum techniques using what we've learned from looking at uh, vectors uh, to represent quantum states using libraries like Q-tip. And then we can go and test those solutions to see if they work, see if we're really actually using the power of um, superposition and entanglement together um, by simulating our uh, solutions in Q-sharp or by doing the math on a piece of paper or with libraries like Q-tip so that we can go use what we've learned about software development to go help us um, make the computer do the math instead of keeping it in our heads. Um, we've covered a lot of ground here. It may not make sense the first time around, that's okay. Just like anything, it takes some time to really practice and that's perfectly fine. I mean, goodness knows, I it took me <laughs> longer than I care to admit to learn some of these things, just like it took me longer than I care to admit to learn what a pointer is, right? We were, so just like any new classical technology or any new programming language or platform, or even just new library, it takes some practice to really kind of internalize and get used to uh, the intuition as to how that works. Um, so, you know, to kind of help build on what you've seen today, I'll suggest uh, my book with uh, Sarah. Um, the documentation provided with a quantum development kit is another really good resource to learn about what all you can do with Q-sharp, what you can do with Q-sharp and Python together, and how you can use those to solve quantum problems. Um, community is essential to this. I mean, no one learns alone. Um, you know, and no one gets everything the first time without, oh, hey, how do I do? So, you know, communities like the Q-Sharp community um, and the Unitary Fund Community Discord are amazing resources to find other people who are working in uh, quantum software development, working on learning quantum computing, or who have been here a while and can answer a few things from where they got stuck in the past, <laughs> or maybe a new area where they're still stuck, even after having been doing this for a while. We're all learning together. We're always learning new stuff. And they're so reaching out to others who are on that learning journey with you is always really important. Um, the other thing that I'll mention is trying things out. You can try things without installing from uh, the TriQ Sharp link that uh, listed there. Um, and that can give you a good way of getting hands on and using tools like Jupyter Notebooks and MyBinder.org together to really get a handle on using software to do quantum computing. Um, so with all that aside, I wanted to leave, sorry, with all that said then, I wanted to leave a few minutes at the end for questions as uh, Anna mentioned a minute ago. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for joining. And if there's anything I can answer for you, please let me know. Really happy to be here today. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Chris. That was a really great um, presentation. Also, thank you, Sarah, for dropping in all those links. I copied them and I will be dropping them into the recording and video description as well. So if you don't note them down now, they won't be lost. As Chris said, we have about 15 minutes for questions. So if you do have a question, either please unmute yourself or drop the question in the chat. Chris does have a hard stop um, at the hour. So if you have any questions, we will take questions now. Um, I have a question. Yeah, um, go on. I uh, don't have a background in uh, computer science, but um, I did do a course in my third year mm -hmm. with um, uh, magnetic uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, mm, resonance. Mm -hmm. and it really reminded me actually with electron spinning with the qubits and the x <laughs> state and the z state is it similar to what you're describing there because oh goodness I, it, it it really resonated with me um and i kind of thought wow i'm actually understanding something about quantum <laughs> i mean I'm laughing as hard as I am because goodness, that brings back all the memories. When I said I did a PhD, I did a PhD in an NMR lab because oh, so many of the fun. ideas that, oh, I mean, the number of times it's like, all right, here's how to fill a helium uh, reservoir and everything. Like, I, I was the theorist. 
uh, in the lab, but you know, the theorists, the theorists always help out by getting, you know, hands on. So I, I was there filling nitrogen tanks and helium tanks and everything and that. No, I, I, I'm laughing because that brings back a lot of memories for me. Um, but you're absolutely right. And it, it's one of the really fun and odd things about the history of quantum computing that when people started developing these ideas around how to use quantum, uh, quantum physics to do uh, computation, well, we didn't really have qubits laying around, but nature makes really neat qubits for us in NMR. So I can really think of the hydrogen spin in water as being a one qubit processor. I can't solve very many problems with that, but I can really test a lot of the techniques that then have been carried over from um, NMR into superconducting qubits and every other kind of, uh, you know, you see the same sorts of, I guarantee you, you talk to any ion trap uh, folks working with uh, their quantum devices, and you'll see a pulse diagram, and they probably wrote early versions of it in something that is not terribly far off like a Bruker pulse programming language. You know, so <laughs> um, you're absolutely right to call that out. We don't really do a lot in the community right now with NMR and quantum computing, but that's because it was a wonderful test bed that we've used over many years to develop that intuition. And that's the intuition we bring forward now. So everything that you've learned about, you know, I mean, I mentioned block sphere. It's that block from, you know, <laughs> in a, uh, the block equations for NMR dynamics. Um, and that's the sorts of ideas that have really carried forward. So wonderful question. Absolutely right to call that out. That's a huge part of this history as to how we got here in the field today. Amazing. Thanks so much for confirming that. <laughs> I feel really happy. No worries at all. Thank you for the question. Do we have any other question? If yes, please drop it in the chat or unmute yourself like Nana just did. Last chance. <laughs> Hopefully right. not oh. entirely last chance. If you think of something after, like exactly. I'm on Twitter and you know email is not, uh, can certainly drop email in uh, chat and things like that. So happy to answer it. Oh, oh. Uh, great question. So there's a, a plugin for Jupyter Notebooks that I really bloody love. I use it all the time called Rise. And it's as simple as pip install Rise, R-I-S-E. And it takes a Jupyter Notebook and turns it into a reveal.js presentation. Um, and so I can switch between the two with the key bind. And it's, it's just a really neat way I find for giving interactive, uh, like using the power of interactive computing offered by the Jupyter platform. They do talks. So no, a great question and definitely recommend checking out Rise um, if you're interested in that. That's super cool. I didn't know about that. Awesome. Cool. Any further questions? All right. If there's no more questions, thank you again, Chris. Um, and yeah. yeah, thank you for being here. It was great to have you. Um, just some information for all of you. We are having our next meetup on November 25th. It'll be announced about two weeks beforehand as always. Um, and thank you so much for joining and have a lovely evening or rest of your day. Um, and I'll see you all soon. Awesome, cool. Thank you um, for having me. It's been wonderful to join. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks. See you all soon. Bye.